May 22nd, 1943. This week, something unusual happens. Nazi German Reichspropaganda Minister Josef Goebbels and head of British Royal Air Force Bomber Command Arthur Harris are uncharacteristically unimpressed by death and destruction. And now, a word from our sponsors. Never forget. Never give up. Never surrender. Join the Time Ghost Army. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olsen. Last week, the Allies continued shelling German cities on a scale the world has never seen before. The genocide of Jews from Greece and Western Europe continued at Auschwitz-Birkenau and Sobibor. The Axis launched another offensive against the partisan-controlled parts of occupied Yugoslavia. The Japanese resumed offensive operations in China, and with it, they reignited their three alls policy to kill all, burn all, and loot all. In Changjiao, they carried out a three-day orgy of rape and murder. 30,000 were killed. In Europe, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was nearly crushed. As this week begins, on May 16th, the murderous crackdown is concluded. Despite very small continuing pockets of Jewish resistance, German commander Jürgen Stropp declares that he is victorious and that the Warsaw Ghetto has been conquered from the Jewish fighters. To celebrate, he orders his men to blow up the great synagogue on Tuomaki Street with dynamite joining the rest of the ghetto, which already lies in ruins. With this feat, he writes that the former Jewish quarter of Warsaw is no longer in existence. Stropp reports his achievements in meticulous detail to Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler, complete with photographs of the actions. Since the beginning of the operation on April 19, 631 dugouts have been destroyed by his men. They have taken nine rifles, 59 pistols, a couple of hundred hand grenades, a few hundred Molotov cocktails, and large amounts of homemade explosives and ammunition. But more than anything, weeks of house-to-house -house fighting, blowing up cellars, and setting whole blocks ablaze has caused immense human suffering. Stropp estimates that five to 6,000 Jews have been killed in the storm of blasts and blazes unleashed by his men. 7,000 more have been murdered immediately on arrest, and 6,929 men, women, and children have been sent to Treblinka extermination factory for immediate murder by gas. Stropp claims he has only lost 17 men and 92 men have been wounded. The Polish resistance estimates that 300 of Stropp's troops have been killed. But 42,000 Jews are also once again in German captivity. They are sent to labor camps throughout occupied Poland like those at Poniatowa, Travniki, and Majdanek, where they are put to work until their bodies are worn out. A handful of Jewish fighters still hold out, hiding in the rubble of the Warsaw Ghetto from which they continue occasionally to attack German patrols. Almost none of them will survive the war. Thousands of kilometers to the southeast in Bengal, British India, survival is also at stake for very different reasons. By now, less and less Bengali people are able to put enough food on the table. This spring, the first harvest is disappointing, but not enough to cause a widespread famine. The yield from harvest is around 5% lower than last year, but even when you factor in population growth and lack of carryover rice from previous seasons, this is still not enough for a famine. In 1941, crop yields were even lower than now, and there wasn't a famine then. It isn't food availability that is causing the looming problem. It's food access. In addition to the supply line from Japanese-occupied Burma being cut off, the British colonial government has restricted surplus imports to coastal regions and prohibited certain provinces from exporting their food surplus. Still not enough to create a famine-level food deficit, but enough to cause rice prices to rise. The Bengali people start to scramble for rice. Prize speculators are buying up stock, people are panic buying more than they need, and there are no paths to compensate for the deficits that result. 
By May 1943, Calcutta rice prices are double what they were in March, and the solution is ready at hand, reopen trade between the Indian regional markets. But the British colonial government states that they fear that this will stoke inflation in those regions as well, and doesn't allow it. Already the lowest income households aren't able to put food on the table, and hunger is commonplace. Without additional measures, the Bengalis are likely to endure severe hunger and starvation. It is unclear what degree of willful negligence and what degree of deliberate policy is now about to cause famine in Bengal, but there is nothing random about the Nazi genocide of the Jews. By the end of the week, the Nazis consider that the Jews have been eradicated from another European capital, their own. Berlin. That's not quite correct, though. As we saw a few weeks ago after the Rosenstrasse demonstrations, Goebbels forced the SS for now to not further pursue the last remaining men of Jewish descent with non-Jewish spouses and children and special permits to work. This was done in order to avoid further public unrest. They are roughly 3,000, and another 7,000 are in hiding. Nonetheless, on May 19, Goebbels declares Berlin Judenfrei for propaganda purposes. And when you consider that 160,000 Jews lived in Berlin in 1933, the small remaining number leaves gaping holes of people gone, many forever. Tens of thousands fled before the war. Those who stayed have now mostly been imprisoned in concentration camps or gassed in extermination facilities. Goebbels is now touting this success as an example to follow for other German cities, occupied territories, and Axis allied nations. In at least one place, that misfires the very same week. For the last months, the people of Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary have been resisting unconditional cooperation with the Nazi genocide. However, on May 21st, Bulgarian Minister of the Interior and the Commissariat for Jewish Affairs, Peter Gabrovsky, signs off on the deportation of the roughly 25,000 Bulgarian Jews in Sofia to villages in the Bulgarian countryside. From there, they are to be transported to the extermination factories in occupied Poland. But while the Bulgarian government is willing to be accomplice to genocide, the Bulgarian people are not. A group of public figures publicly appeal to King Boris III that the decision is inhumane, telling him that he would be personally responsible for any consequences of the deportations. In the days after, Jews as well as non-Jewish Bulgarians take to the streets to protest the decision. Some threaten to block the deportation trains with their bodies. The protests are violently broken up by Bulgarian police forces and the Jews of Sofia will be deported to labor camps across the country in the coming days and weeks. But Boris holds off on surrendering the Bulgarian Jews to the Germans for murder, for now. Telling Adolf Eichmann, in charge of the genocide's logistics, and German Führer Adolf Hitler, that Bulgaria needs their Jews for infrastructure and construction and manufacturing. While the Germans continue to pursue the total annihilation of the Jews of Europe, the Western Allies once again step up their systematic destruction of Germany. The wholesale bombing of German cities during the Battle of the Ruhr pauses for a week. Instead, the RAF carries out Operation Chastise to hit German dams with a special new type of bomb, the Wallace Bouncing Bomb. As the dams flood the lands below them, 1,294 people are killed as a direct result, many of them slave laborers from Eastern Europe. The reaction both in Germany and in England is muted. Goebbels and his department make no propaganda of the affair, as the general view in 1943 is that blowing up dams, even if civilians are killed in the process, is legitimate warfare. Crying outrage that the Allies are fighting their war won't rile anyone up. In England, Arthur Harris, head of the RAF Bomber Command, is disappointed by the lack of strategic impact of the operation on German industry, morale, and infrastructure. But it will have an effect on Germany going forward. The inventor of the bouncing bombs used in the Dambuster raids, Barnes Wallace, has been lobbying another concept to Harris for some time, the earthquake bomb. The idea is 
simple in theory, but not so much in practice. Create a very, very heavy bomb that is perfectly aerodynamic and drop it from extreme altitude. With very little air resistance, the bomb will reach supersonic speeds before it impacts. At such speed, the mass of the bomb will carry a massive momentum. With an armor-piercing tip, it will then penetrate deep into the earth or any structure it hits, up to 40 meters. Set to explode only when it reaches such depth, Wallace estimates that the explosion will create a 3.6 magnitude earthquake, destroying any physical structures in a fairly large radius. His idea is that this will make carpet bombing unnecessary even with the documented poor, or should we say rather non-existent targeting capacity of current technology. He argues that this will make it possible to disrupt German industry with a lower civilian death toll. There's only one problem. Although the bomb is feasible, there are no airplanes capable of carrying this massive bomb to the needed altitude of 12 kilometers. Regardless, after the technical success of Operation Chastise, Harris now greenlights further development of the earthquake bomb. While the bombs continue to rain down in Germany, a storm front of anti-partisan violence is moving over occupied Yugoslavia. Since the launch of Operation Schwarz, or Operation Black, on May 15th, the German forces have been slowly but steadily moving in on the mountains of the Dormitor Massif in northwestern Montenegro in an effort to disarm the Chetnik fighters and to obliterate the partisan forces of Josip Tito. By the end of this week, roughly 4,000 Chetnik fighters have been captured and disarmed. The rest of the Chetnik forces have scattered and fled with the help of their, and Germany's ally, the Italians. Not what the Germans wanted, but the goal to neutralize the Chetnik as a military threat has been reached, and the focus becomes to only fight the partisans. The Italians now join, throwing in three divisions, the Torinese, Venezia and Ferrara, to complete the planned encirclement from the north and southeast. The Axis forces feel confident that they will be able to move the partisan forces together in a cauldron and annihilate them. Much to the Germans and Italians' surprise, the partisans do not retreat, but launch several counter-offensives, hoping to break out of the encirclement. First to the east, where the partisans tried to break through the lines of the German 1st Mountain Division from May 15th to May 19th. When that turns out to be a futile effort, the weight of the partisan counteroffensive shifts to Fotza in the west. Starting May 21st, Tito launches attack after attack on the left flank of the German 118th Jäger Division and the Croatian 4th Mountain Brigade. Simultaneously, on the German right flank, two partisan brigades are battering the SS battalion Hahn, putting it under severe pressure. Operation Schwarz is not going according to plan. The Axis expected to encounter small guerrilla forces and imagine they'd be able to mop them up by overwhelming them with superior superpower. But instead, they're now facing an increasingly regular army which seems capable of overwhelming the German lines. So ends another week of death and destruction. Perhaps it is specifically because it is just another week in the war against humanity that Goebbels and Harris failed to be stirred by the effects of Operation Chastise. And indeed, when you follow all of this terror week after week, this week does seem a little slow. So we should be glad, right? Except it wasn't a slow week. Thousands upon thousands died. Tens of thousands of innocent people were deported, incarcerated, and slated to be murdered. Hundreds of thousands stood up for humanity despite living in an authoritarian, fascist state. Resistance turned into regular military battle with all the horrors that brings. And in the Warsaw Ghetto, a heroic stand came to a bloody end with a staggering death toll. In 1943, that might be the new normal. But if you get used to that kind of normal, if you allow numbness and indifference to set in, if, when you witness the lives of others cut short, you begin to accept that as normal, well, then you have lost what makes you human, what sets you apart from other animals, compassion and respect beyond your immediate circle. 
It is especially when darkness becomes the rule that we must continue to be outraged, express that outrage, and stand up for what is right. Otherwise, defeat becomes our destiny, and we have just joined a long line that will likely lead us to becoming the victims that we just forgot. Never forget. <laughs>